Your Royal Highness, Your Excellency, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our closing pl plenary on the sustainable use of natural resources through local innovations, part of the last day of the EarthNA Summit 2023. My name is Foliba Thibault, and it's an honor and a pleasure to be here with you all. I will kindly ask you first to please turn your mobile phones off as the session we're about to hear and the conversations we're about to hear and the presentations we're about to witness are very important and we don't want, to, don't want any disruptions. So I would kindly ask you once again to turn off your mobile phones. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, as we've learned over the past two days here at the EarthNA Summit, the impact of climate change is no longer a future threat but a clear and present danger. And we must remember that there are some countries and regions who are facing more risks than others. But there is no one-size-fits-all solution to these climate challenges that we're facing. 
So we must be diverse and resourceful in our quest to find answers by seeking out knowledge and the best practices in how we can build a sustainable future. We must also, as a matter of principle, look to our past and see what lessons can be drawn out and carried out into our future. Ancestral indigenous knowledge is a unique, rich source of understanding and respect of our natural world. The loss and erosion of indigenous communities' way of life represents a critical risk in our fight against climate change. So, ladies and gentlemen, we want to use this session as a platform for some of this knowledge to be shared to you, our audience. We'll hear from a Denisline elder from Canada's Northwest Territories who's active in protecting the Dene way of life, a community which has adapted to extreme arid and cold weather conditions for generations. We will also hear from our own Qatari Bedouin leaders who will share their experience and wisdom on how their ancestors adapted to the extreme arid and hot nature of the Qatari desert. So without further ado, Your Highness, Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome our first distinguished guest, Denisaline Elder, and a member of the Smith's Landing First Nation and a longtime advocate for indigenous and treaty rights in Canada, Elder Francois Paulette. Please join us on stage. <laughs> Salotina <laughs> All my relations, I'm thankful to have traveled this distance to be here. And before me are two, Your Highness, Excellency, I'm thankful in your presence. I'm here to talk about a way of life that expands in memory. And we refer to that in my language, Denechanye. Denechanye translated literally means the path we walk. 
in the past, the present, and the future. The tribe that I come from, since time we could remember, long before the dinosaurs, they say that our people traveled the stars. This teaching, this Dinachania, is a spiritual way of life to live. We see everything as spiritual. To all of this center is water. Water is life. Water provides everything that we need to survive on Mother Earth. Dinachania, the spiritual, everything is alive. Everything has a spirit. The water, the rocks, the trees. Everything is alive. And with that, we have the emotions, our heart. What we feel and how we feel when we see the sacred of sacreds, the buffalo. Spirituality, emotion, and the mental well-being. It's descriptive of how we see and think about life around us and all of the physical being, so the spirit, the emotion, the mind, and the body. This Dinachania is balance, balance. Before the Europeans came to our world, we had balance. We had ceremonies that looked at and thanked the Creator, God, maker of all good things, and His helpers, which we refer to as the ancestors, the holy people. The holy people intervene on our behalf to God. When I was a young man, this balance that I grew up in was shattered. I was taken from my family at the age of six, stolen from my family, and brought to a residential school, totally foreign. And the first thing that he did was they cut off my hair, a symbol of power, but they cut it off. I remember crying for my hair for one week. For three years, they worked to break my spirit. For three years, they worked on assimilating me. 
The fourth year, I ran away. My oldest brother that is now not here with me, and my younger brother, we never returned to this institution. It is a sad period of our history. And today you'll hear in the news in Canada that you are finding grief sites where genocide became common in back in those days. But with the help of the ancestors, I managed to keep on, to hold on to my language. Where I come from is I come from a large tribe. We're the second largest tribe in Canada. There is 11 tribal entities in Canada, about 54 different languages. Today, the Dinechania has given me a path to walk on. I have six boys, two daughters, and I have 11 beautiful grandchildren. Five girls, six boys. My wife, she is from a different tribe, the Mohawk tribe. If you studied history in Canada, the Mohawks are regarded as fierce people. I will tell you this story. It's when I first brought my wife back to my country. I was a chief. Well, sometime I would say I stole her from the tribe. But I'm extending the story. But when I did bring her home, I introduced her to my father. Now, this was to tell my father, this woman is a Mohawk. And he couldn't figure that out because the Mohawks were way in the east. So he says, is he a Cree? Is he all this? No, 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 no. And I said, in history, the Mohawks, the, when the Jesuit priests came into the country, the, the, the Mohawks tore out the, peop the heart of the Jesuits. And I said, that's the tribe she comes from. Ah, he says, Bagong East, I heard about that. He says, you better watch yourself. <laughs> she is a midwife. She is retired. I don't know how many children she's delivered. But May, 9th, May the 19th, 13th, she retired. Anyway, she says to me in the morning, my husband, I'm officially retired today. I said, good. And he said, she says to me, from here on, 
I'm going to devote my life to you. Wow. I'm still waiting. <laughs> we have sacred teachings in our tribe. We learned this from an early age. These secret teachings are love, love. Love is a powerful feeling. Love can also be the opposite. To have love for my grandchildren unconditionally. They are the center of my life. Respect. Respect for all creation. Respect yourself. Respect for other tribal people. Respect for people that live in this land. It is part of my teaching. Honesty. Honesty is big, is huge. Honesty to how you talk to people. Courage. Courage to do things, to walk a path, sometime is your, you're by yourself. And I've done that many times. I have very little fear in my life. The only fear I have is my wife. <laughs> Humility. Humility. Humility for men is a difficult one to handle. <laughs> I say that because I'm a traditional dancer. And men in traditional outfit, you are the center. You are like, men become like a peacock. And it is difficult to be humble. That the teaching that is learned through fasting, fasting. Where how we fast is we fast for four days. No water, no food. So everything around us, including the little bugs, to animals that come to visit you, that makes you humble. Wisdom. Wisdom is a teaching. And wisdom may come in many forms. You can achieve knowledge through books. You can achieve knowledge through television. But wisdom comes from the land. Wisdom is the teaching that comes from you talk to the water, the water talks to you. You talk to the great buffalo, in return, he advises you. That is wisdom. And finally, truth. 
the truth. That's the sacred teaching, the seven sacred teachings. Climate crisis, we don't refer to change, we say climate crisis. We are, where I live, we are in a huge problem. And the North is vast, it is very sensitive. Up the river from where I live, there are the tar sands that is polluting the water, the air. Our people down the river, that river extends 1,500 miles, and people are dying of cancer because the impact of this dirty oil that they're taking out of the ground. The industrial impact has harmed our people. This beautiful herd of buffalo are impacted the moose, the deer. When we go, to, when we hunt, when we get a moose, we quarter it, the first thing we look for is sickness. We never had to do that, never. but we do that. The food that we get, that we buy in the stores, <laughs> is expensive. Expensive. Food security becomes an issue for us because we depend on the four leggeds, all of the animals, the birds, the wingeds, the migratory birds that come over are also impacted by pollution. So to buy a loaf of bread in some places is ten dollars to buy a quart of milk in places is fifteen dollars so what we are doing is we're re is we are moving into making changes and by that I mean we are dependent, we are now going to solar energy. Wind energy, biomass from way in the ground to heat the homes. And there are people now turning to what we call greenhouses. So the so they can feed their children. So we are confronted with changes that we've never had to do. It's amazing. It is quite amazing. Today, as 500 years ago, we depended on our elders. The knowledge of the elders. Elders 
need to be utilized more so than we have ever done. We need knowledge keepers. We need people of that caliber working in a department environment. We have that where I come from. Because they are the, no, they are the people that know the land best and the water. So the government are now depending on the elders for answers to this climate crisis we're going through. Not too long ago, I've attended nine COP meetings, climate change. And I just shared a story. I was traveling with two other chiefs. And there was this Saudi Arabian, Saudi Arabian, that was going back and forth. And She, she was a woman. She was educated. And she came up to us and said, are you Native Americans? I said, yes. And she said, before I came here, the Bedouins said, when you go over there, you need to seek out Native American elders, teachers, they have the answers. From the Paulette case. And my wife turns to him and says, yeah, that is the Paulette. And that young man said, I thought he would be fossilized by now. <laughs> But here I am, of those 16 chiefs that filed that caveat, I'm the only living chief. And I'm happy to be here, to be speaking in front of you. It's a blessing, it's an honor. Because Mother Earth is shrinking and she's crying out for our help. The water is crying out for our help. I want to just close by, I'm getting conscious of time. <laughs> Five minutes. Okay, give me five. <laughs> day. Thank you so much, my brothers, my sisters. I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Mercy, Mercy. very much to Elder Francois Paulette from the Smith Landing Nation, First Nation in Canada for that powerful and moving speech. Thank you for traveling a long distance to come and be with us here today. Thank you so much. As Elder Paulette said there, wisdom comes from the elders. We need to utilize the knowledge of our elders who know the land and the water better than anyone else. Thank you once again. Thank you very much. And now, ladies and gentlemen, to hear about the Qatari Bedouin experience and knowledge. I would like to invite Habes Howell, Head of External Relations at Qatar Foundation, who is going to be joined by a Bedouin representative, Ali Taleb Al-Henzab, 
and they'll be telling us about Bedouin traditions and natural conservation here in Qatar. Welcome. Your Highness, Your Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I will not also forget our virtual followers. Peace and God's mercy be uh, upon you. Here we start and here we come back and here we talk about the importance of values and indigenous uh, knowledge and we go back to focusing on the presenting uh, experiences based on indigenous knowledge. I am happy to uh, host one of the local Qatari community members uh, from the Bedouin as desert of Qatar, where environment was the real school and the ancestors were the teachers and the knowledge which transferred from a generation to the other was their content and curricula. And days were the test that they took and through uh, which they overcame all environmental challenges through their practices and the values that they have used. I am happy to host Mr. Ali bin Talib al Hinzab. He is an environmental activist who plants endangered Qatari plants and has an initiative, an agricultural initiative as well. What is beautiful about Ali's story and the beginning of our uh, question, you have lived in the desert with your father. How did this period shape your environmental knowledge when we started with uh, the young people and with my parents my grandfather uh, used to have a mobile school. He tried as much as he could to convey the information properly. The names of the uh, trees and the valleys and the areas, it was inspirational. And uh, even during prayers, the uh, noon prayer, Dohar prayer, when we were uh, five, he would raise his voice so that we could learn and uh, uh, recite the uh, Quran and and the various verses uh, after him. And so this shaped a knowledge of all plants and their seasons. And it's all thanks to my grandfather. May God uh, have mercy on his soul. I have knowledge on how to plant them, how to preserve them, how to convey this information to our children. What are the key things that you learned from your grandfather in these years? The most important thing is to take what we need from the environment without harming it in, uh, with, with our livestock, with using the groundwater and the stormwater. As much as we could, we take what we need and move from a place to a place as nomads without harming the environment. And we could have the food that we need from the uh, trees and do not last uh, in a one place uh, in a way that drains it. No, we preserve it and we uh, um, go back with our livestock after the trees have regrown. So we use it to a couple of months and then we go to another place. What are the key traditions and costumes that we that you used dealing with the environment? We know that in that time you used to have costumes that you applied to individuals, especially in relation to preserving and protecting the environment. So my grandfather, whenever he used to have a problem, whether a tribal problem or any other problem, he used to take me with you. I used to accompany him to listen to the process or the thing that is being discussed. Uh, so uh, if you try to cut trees, uh, you would be punished for that because uh, I want to ask you why. Because uh, uh, we're going to see a depletion of all trees. So, so we were not uh, allowed to cut trees unless uh, trees have fallen and they are no longer alive. So uh, this was something that we used to follow in the past. 
because now, after the situation changed and after uh, uh, oil was discovered, uh, we have other alternatives. So what are the most important practices uh, that the Bedouins used to follow in order to preserve the environment? So what were the practices that prevailed at the time? So we used to preserve the environment uh, through a number of things. So we do not uh, try to cut trees. Uh, so if uh, it rains, uh, so uh, we uh, try to uh, use that water. So we we used to have a number of arrangements when it comes to rain fall and water that comes from rain. These were the base, basic things that we used to follow. So how did you deal with the environment? How did you use the resources without leaving any waste? We did not have any waste because the capabilities at the time were very limited. And we used to carry out what is called uh, reuse or uh, so uh, recycling. So we used to uh, make the best of each and every component. Uh, so, uh, so what was the most important component? So it was sustainability. So if we do not have an environment, we don't have anything, and you would like eventually. So. Uh, so if there is any tribal problem, so we will try to solve our problems through uh, cooperation with each other. So the urban life, to what extent did it impact your life as an individual? And how did it impact our lives uh, as a community? The environment is no longer as it used to be. So urbanization has taken us away from our life, schools, the livelihood, and so on and so forth. But thank God I was able to go back to my previous life, to the environment I used to have. So we are the environment. This is what I tell the people. If we do not exist, there is no environment. We have to preserve the environment. We have to plant. We have to tell our kids how we lived and how we're going to live tomorrow. So sustainability sustainability is us. The environment is our environment. So uh, on the 26th of February, so this is the uh, National Environment Day in the state of Qatar. So many people try to plant and preserve the areas that they have. I just hope that each one of us would at least plant one tree or at least preserve the tree that is next to you. The real danger, if you think that it is the ministry that is in charge of the environment, no, no, this is the job of each individual every person that lives in this country. We live in an Islamic country. To what extent do you think that Islam has reinforced sustainability, agriculture, and the preservation of the environment? Our role model is Prophet Muhammad. He's called us to plant trees. He says, if doomsday comes and you have a small tree, then you have to plant that tree before you leave. So even if doomsday comes, this shows the importance, the greatness of trees. And also, uh, Abu Bakr, one of the guided caliphs uh, of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, so when he sent Muslims to the Levant area, he said, do not cut trees, do not burn trees. And this does not apply to what you should implement in your own country, even if you go somewhere else. When you talk about trees, you're talking about a factory of oxygen. So this is a great period. So. The values of Islam uh, constituted a great protection for the environment. These values preserve the rights of human beings, the rights of the environment, and even beyond. So uh, your father got these precepts from his grandfather, and so on and so forth. So how can we transfer these uh, ideas and principles to our grandchildren? This is a great responsibility. So this is incumbent on our forefathers, uh, old people, fathers and mothers, may God preserve them. They should be part and parcel of our day-to-day -day program. So we should go back to them at least for half a day, a half a, an hour a day. So these should be part and parcel of our holidays, of our school sessions. These people should give us ideas as to how we would be able to preserve the environment. So this generation, if it does not have leading persons, leaders, these are the generation that goes to rule 
for tomorrow. So yesterday we had a dear guest who talked about local culture, and he talked about oral uh, local culture that should be documented. So how can we transfer this uh, uh, knowledge and culture through the different uh, institutions? And if you can talk about the role that you have undertaken in the previous period of time, with the help of God Almighty, I concentrated the last year and this year on schools. Uh, so we have tried to distribute small trees uh, on them. Uh, so uh, we uh, uh, would would uh, saplings. Uh, so uh, there are so many students that really love to plant. Uh, so give them those small trees, those sample, the saplings, uh, and give them the opportunity to plant them. This is going to grow great in their hearts. Uh, so with the God, uh, with the help of God Almighty, we are attempting to help uh, children because we want to have uh, uh, children who take initiatives in this uh, realm. Since you're talking about uh, this uh, particular topic. So how are we going to be able to encourage uh, people that have initiatives? How can we encourage them to have real initiatives? There should be an incubator for those initiatives. Uh, we're all fallibles. We're all making mistakes. Uh, but what is important is that, yeah, that we should be able to go ahead with these ideas through incubation, help uh, the uh, persons that have initiatives and I was talking a while ago about planting trees and seedlings of course so uh, this is very important we should teach our youth how to plant those seedlings so if we do that where should we head we have to teach them we have to give them directives an incubation system so if I am a new entrepreneur or a person who has a new uh, initiative I should go to the right department I should officially head to that department Department. Uh, and this is going to be the right basis for such endeavor. So how can we encourage these uh, environment initiatives? Uh, and I'm talking here in particular about individual initiatives. Uh, personally speaking, I really want to see uh, things uh, achieved during the Environment Day as we achieve during Sports Day. Imagine, imagine each one of us here in this hall is able to plant uh, two uh, trees, two seedlings. If you cannot plant, at least deliver the message. Uh, so I would like to go back to you as a father. What were you able to transfer from your father to your children? So I talk to my children about the love of trees, the love of soil, and taught them things about trees in general, medical trees that our forefathers used to use. I also talked to about the importance of seedlings and how to avoid any damage and loss. And also I was able to give them the opportunity to have their own trees and each one of my children is in charge of that particular tree and I told them that uh, if uh, they are flourishing then they would be uh, given something in return so my children they know a great deal about this topic uh, we've come to the end of this session what do you want to say at the end of this session I call upon you to plant trees or at least not to cut trees. So this is a great message. If you are not somebody who's going to plant trees, at least do not cut trees. Our word irthuna in the Arabic language has five letters. So that is why irthuna should be well instilled in our hearts and it should continue until the last day of our life and it should adapt to the reality for it to continue continue. Our heritage, Irthuna, should be innovative. Our forefathers were able to come up with solutions despite the fact that they had limited resources. They were very much keen on the environment. Irthuna should expand generation after generation until it reaches the many, many generations to come. And our Irthuna, which is our legacy, should be sustainable. I have come to the end of it. May the peace and blessings of God be upon you all. Thank you. Well, 
شكرا جزيلا نشكرك جزيلا الشكر لأنك أطلعتنا بتاريخ دولة قطر الثري إن نشكر فرانسوا بوليت كما تعلمنا في اليومين السابقين في هذه القمة قد يكون هناك الكثير من الحلول بالنسبة We must also ensure that sustainable solutions and innovative and technological advances are built on the legacy that's passed on from our ancestors and remind ourselves of the important role as custodians that we play of our planet Earth to ensure that we pass it on to our future generations. And if we can do that, we would have guaranteed our sustainable legacy. We will bring the EARTHNA Summit to a close very shortly. Before we do that, I'd like to invite the Executive Director of EARTHNA, Dr. Gonzalo Castro de la Mata, to give the closing remarks. Thank you very, very much. Your Highness, Your Excellency, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Assalam alaikum. I am Gonzalo Castro Lamata, the CEO of the Erna Center for a Sustainable Future at Qatar Foundation. And I want to start by thanking everybody for this amazing two days we just had. When opening the summit, Her Excellency Sheikh Hind bin Hamad Al Thani, Vice Chairperson and CEO of Qatar Foundation, spoke eloquently on the timely importance of focusing on sustainability in Had and Ari countries and the importance of cultural heritage and indigenous knowledge in this regard. On behalf of those involved in the summit, I would like to thank Her Excellency and Her Highness Sheikh Mosa bin Nasser, not only for their role in making this event a success, but also their commitment to putting sustainability at the heart of Qatar's development. I would also like to thank His Excellency Sheikh Dr. Faleh bin Nasser Al Thani, Minister of Environment and Climate Change, for his participation in the summit and his ongoing support for EARTHNAS work. Over the past two days, more than 70 experts from a wide range of countries, organizations, and businesses have generously given up their time to share their wisdom and insight, to contribute to discussions, and to demonstrate cultural practices and share indigenous knowledge. Over 1,000 people have attended the summit and the Earthna village, and many more have joined online. The summit is entirely carbon neutral and took place here in Misheraf, one of the first sustainable precincts in the world. To all our participants and attendees, I share sincere thanks. Each one of you has played a role in ensuring the summit's success and help us to reframe the understanding of sustainability in hot and arid environments. Thank you also to our partners and sponsors. We are very grateful for your involvement, support, ideas, and guidance. Your collaboration and commitment have been invaluable, and we look forward to continuing our work with you in the future. I would also like to extend my heartfelt thanks to the people who brought the Erna Summit to life to the many team members behind the scenes from EARTHNA, Qatar Foundation, and Misheraf, thank you. In his opening address at the United Nations Least Developed Countries Conference, which began earlier this week here in Doha, His Highness, the Amir Sheikh Tamim bin Hamad Al Thani, noted that finding the solutions to food security challenges, climate change, and the energy crisis is a collective task and that the responsibility for doing so lies with every, sitting, every citizen and every country. The aim of the 2023 Erna Summit aligns perfectly with this. Our goal was to convene stakeholders from across the world to facilitate the sharing of research, innovation, and insights, and gain a deeper understanding of the environmental challenges and opportunities that countries with hot and arid environments face. In this way, creating new sustainability pathways that are relevant to these countries. So what have we learned? I would like to summarize the main outcomes emerging from these discussions. For our first stream, we discussed that sustainability means something different in hot and arid environments than it does in countries with temperate 
and tropical climates. One of the main insights relates to sustainability frameworks for countries such as Qatar. Qatar's economy is not supported by its natural environment. Instead, it is an economy where its non-renewable natural resources in the form of gas are transformed into human capital, infrastructure, savings and investments. Sustainability needs to be understood in this context. In this sense, we have clearly established that globally recognized sustainability frameworks must be adapted to reflect our unique and challenging environment and those in our hard and arid environments. We have also heard that very often we forget the great progress that human societies have achieved in the last centuries and how human well-being is also an essential part of sustainability. All indicators related to societal, societal well-being in all countries continue to improve thanks to innovation, science, and technology. We cannot ignore progress, but rather learn to make future progress environmentally and socially sustainable. On the second summit stream, we learned that we can combine technology with traditional knowledge to build more resilient and sustainable food systems that are able to withstand the impacts of climate change. Climate change will have a drastic impact on society's ability to produce food. As dry countries become drier and water becomes scarcer, we will see increasing pressure on farming and food security. During the summit, we have confirmed the development, the development of food technology can also draw inspiration from traditional farming practices, indigenous knowledge, and the genetic variation of crops that is maintained by those who have farmed the same land for generations. We have also looked at the importance of encouraging and enabling self-sufficiency at national and international levels and gain a better understanding of how to manage food surplus and supply. I am delighted that at the summit, heads of state and ministers of foreign affairs from Sub-Saharan Africa have committed to a new collaborative approach with EARTHNA and other partners to enhance food security, which I know will lead to lasting and impactful action and make a significant contribution to this country's adaptation to climate change. Under the third stream, energy and climate, we discussed that many countries with hot and arid climates are major producers of hydrocarbons. And we heard that because of this, they have a pivotal role to play in the energy transition and fight against climate change. Throughout the summit, we have considered many different aspects of climate change, including economic impact, the importance of youth in driving solutions, and green technology, including photovoltaics and solar energy. I am particularly pleased that we have taken a close look at the links between energy and climate change. Renewable energy remains central to the future of sustainable and clean power generation. But we also need to acknowledge that not all fossil fuels have the same level of environmental impact. I am pleased that during the summit, we have been able to re-emphasize that cleaner and less carbon intensive fuels, such as natural gas, will be a key component of the global energy mix in the years to come. And as the gas chain decarbonizes through technology, the useful life horizon of natural gas will increase. For example, natural gas exports from Qatar have significantly reduced global emissions by displacing the more carbon-intensive coal over the last 20 years. The final stream was on biodiversity and values. We demonstrated the critical importance of reestablishing a connection with nature to help halt the loss of biodiversity and ecosystems. During the summit, we released the results of a new study on the state of natural ecosystems in Qatar. Our se sessions also explored the importance of human interactions with nature and ways to increase public support for the protection of biodiversity. And we have looked at how people and organizations from across societies can come together to create lasting and meaningful change. Last but not least, the summit, we found a common thread, the importance of drawing on cultural heritage heritage and indigenous knowledge to inspire modern sustainability approaches. Through the stories of speakers, the discussions during sessions, and the incredible exhibitions and demonstrations at the Erna village, we have gained a greater understanding of traditional practices and the impact that this can have on ecosystem management and climate adaptation today. 
We have also looked at how we can draw inspiration from Islam and different faiths and historic cultural practices to promote more sustainable lifestyles today. It is difficult for me to summarize the immense value of the summit in just a few minutes. However, I hope you will agree that each person who has taken part in our and has attended a summit session will have been inspired by the discussions, knowledge sharing, agreements, and debate, and that this will have a positive impact not only on their work, but also on their lives. And the input that we have received from many participants will actively inform the development of important reports in many topics, and we look forward to sharing the results of these research streams soon. Before I close, I would like to touch on what holding the summit means for EARTHNA, as 2023 promises to be an exciting year for us. We will continue to fly the flag of hot and arid environments at international events, such as COP28, where we will be actively raising the profile of the new unique challenges that we face and our response to this. Later in the year, Doha will host the 2023 International Horticultural Expo. This is a major opportunity for us to influence global thinking around climate change. We will also continue to focus on driving, driving action locally. And I am pleased to announce that in September of this year, we will hold the second Qatar National Dialogue on Climate Change, which last year saw over 200 participants coming together to focus on how Qatar will be impacted by climate change and what mitigation and adaptation measures we can implement. And in October, we will launch Qatar Sustainability Week 2023 with the aim of raising awareness of sustainable practices amongst the local community and driving action at the grassroots level. Let me close by emphasizing that both individually and collectively, our people and countries will be an integral part of the solution. I will end by saying a final thank to everyone who has helped to make the summit a success. Thank you very much. very much. That brings the Earthness Summit to a close. Thank you for attending. It's been a real honor. Have an excellent afternoon here in Doha. Thank you for your time. Thank you.